This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, happy Friday, and welcome to another year of Friday Fellows Conference. Uh, our structure is going to be pretty similar. We're going to be doing this most every Friday from now and until the end of May. We'll have some journal clubs and um, morbidity mortality conferences sort of sprinkled in throughout the year. Um, but kicking us off this year is one of our second year clinical track fellows, Dr. Eduardo Quintero. Uh, Eduardo's from Venezuela, where he did his uh, medical school training, um, uh, did his residency in Philadelphia at Albert Einstein. Um, and today he's going to talk to us about complications of heart transplantation. So, Eduardo, take it away. Thank you, Dr. William, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm excited to initiate the Cardiology Fellows Conference for this academic year. The title for this presentation is Heart Transplantation, Embracing a New Life Journey with Long-Term Challenges. As a fellow, I found this topic um, particularly intriguing because during my residency and my medical school years in Venezuela, I did not have the opportunity of taking care of this uh, unique and vulnerable patient population. So I don't have any financial or non-financial disclosure. And the learning objective of this presentation basically are to explain the multi-phase aspects of long-term care of heart transplant recipients, comprehend the critical role of immunosuppression therapy in heart transplant patients, while also gaining insight into potential complications associated with its use. Also to demonstrate proficiency in the management of common complications that can arise in heart transplant patients, yeah. like infection, rejection, coronary yeah. allograft vasculopathy, and arrhythmias. So let's start talking about oh. immunosuppression. When I started doing this talk, I realized that the principal goal of immunosuppression is to balance the prevention of allograft rejection that can lead to allograft dysfunction and a effect of the immunotherapy. So basically you have to make an equilibrium because too much immunosuppression can give you all the complications on the left, too little can give you graft dysfunction. Unfortunately, there are no evidence-based approach to determine the lowest effective immunosuppression dose or regimen. Therefore, for that reason, um, the we use levels and surveillance of graft health with imaging studies, mm -hmm. and also we use endomyocardial cardiac valves. So when I was doing the presentation, this was a picture that stood in my mind. Basically, this is what a lot of patients behave. You have to balance between too much or too little. Early after heart transplant, corticosteroids, they play a critical role in avoiding rejection. But we know that long-term effect of these medications can cause serious complications like Cushing's, diabetes, and other long-term complications. Therefore, um, there's been uh, studies in the past that have tried to show that early withdrawal of corticosteroids can be done. So this was a study done in 2011. It's called a TTAC study. Uh, basically, it compared the use of tacrolimus alone versus the use of tacrolimus in combination with mycophenolate uh, mofetil. Okay. And the uh, principal goal of the study was different. Uh, it was to uh, see if there was an advantage of use as uh, another agent over a single agent like tacrolimus in terms of rejection, allograft vasculopathy, or, or, or survival, three years survival. But which was interesting of this study was that all of the patients, they were able to be withdrawn of corticosteroids around week number nine. So based on this data, uh, steroid withdrawal is reasonable for heart recipients with low risk of rejection, especially those that have um, no evidence of circulating anti-HLA antibodies yes. or non-multiparous women and those that do not have any history of rejection. 
patient population, like patients with sarcoidosis, we know that corticosteroids uh, remains the treatment for most of these patients. Therefore, there's some a small observation of studies that have shown that long-term steroids are generally recommended in patients who have been transplanted in the past due to cardiacoidosis. This is a graph that shows that in pediatric population, the use of steroids had decreased in the last decade from around like 74% to around like 66%. So there's good advice and guidance regarding try to withdraw the steroids as early as possible. One of the pillars of uh, treating in, uh, patients with heart transplant with immunosuppression are the calcium neuron inhibitors. We know the cyclosporine and hyperlimus. When we are in our rotations, we can see the patients coming in and they usually are in one of these medications. Uh, in my personal experience during my heart failure rotation, it was tacrolimus. Um, and then the issue with calcium neuro inhibitors is they can cause major side effects and major issues. One of the most common one is like kidney kidney issues. And as we see in the illustration, by inhibiting the calcium neuron, increase the transcription in the nucleus of profibrotic gene, leading to increase in the tissue growth factor beta that stimulates the myofibroblast to produce um, activation and increase the extracellular matrix, causing fibrosis of the kidneys. Some studies uh, have demonstrated beneficial effects on preservation of renal function. Um, basically, with careful patient selection, when the dose uh, is appropriately minimized, or sometimes it can be being replaced for other medications like the proliferation signal inhibitors that we know as sarolimus or uh, everolimus. There was this trial done uh, with everolimus where Botina and, and his team performed a multi-center upper label trial comparing the immediate versus delayed PSI initiation. When we talk about PSI, we talk about serolimus and everolimus. And it showed that initiation immediately after heart transplant was associated with poor safety profile. And this was driven initially with pericardial effusion. Therefore, um, the guidelines um, recommend the following, like we talked before, we have to try to uh, withdraw corticosteroids within a year. This is class one. And also lower levels of calcium neuron in heart transplant recipients should be saw when um, they are used in conjunction with other medications like microphenolate, right. because this combination lowers uh, levels and are safe with lower rejection rates. Um, also, in heart transplant recipients that have chronic kidney disease prior to the um, surgery, the exposure to calcium neurons should be lower to the minimal level possible. What is the main issue? That we don't have a specific level. Um, the initiation of a PSI should be done with the reduction or withdrawal of the calcium neuron calcium neuron inhibitors um, and should be done cautiously within the three months. This is like due to the data that I just show that show that has a low safety profile. Other complications that we can see in patients post transplant are neurologic complications. They can include neurocognitive disorders, neurovascular complications, peripheral neurology, visual loss, CNS infection due to immunosuppression, and CNS lymphomas. In one of the most common one is cerebrovascular accidents. And in adults rich with uh, mechanical circulatory support, specifically ELBA, the stroke risk after transplant has been reported an incidence between 2.2% to around like 107 like in this study. Um, this was a retrospective single center study that was done between 1994 and 2016 that showed that patients with a stroke of any type were more likely to have worsening renal function. Also, it shows that they were more likely to have C2 megalovirus infection and the risks that were associated with stroke were older age, 
in diabetes. And it shows that patients that had a stroke were more predisposed to have more combined organ transplantations. One of the other uh, complications that can appear is posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So usually the symptoms that the patient present with is going to, they're going to be visual disturbance, seizures, and altered consciousness. And the risk factor includes history of hypertension, which a lot of our patients does have, do have uh, acute, renal function, acute renal failure. The use of uh, immunosuppression therapy if they, and if they have history of autoimmune disease. Although we diagnose this usually is MRI a scan of the brain, which is going to show edema, which is often but not exclusively. And it can show the white matter in the posterior cortical and subcortical sub structure. Usually the, the, the treatment involves correcting the identical triggers and supporting the patients through the acute phase of the illness. In general, press would subside with uh, blood pressure control and reduction of the calcium neuron dose. Um, as patients mm -hmm. with calcium neuron and press, generally they will have supratherapeutic levels. In severe cases, yeah. there might be the situation where the calcium neuron will need to be uh, withdrawn, yeah. switched to other immunosuppression aids. Other common complication can be seizures, seizures, but usually these are related to um, electrolyte abnormality. It can be a representation of a cerebrovascular event. It could be related to infection, tumor, or a birth effect of anti-rejection medication. In patients that they have history of epilepsy and those require anti-epileptic drug, we yeah. have to be really careful in consideration uh, with the seizure medication yeah. that they receive due to drug and drug and interaction. So ideally we should avoid phenobarbital by growing acid and carbamazepine. Yeah. And phosphenitoin can be used, but it's usually used with caution and the uh, medication that is usually used in patients for transplant, they have seizure is levetiracetam, yeah. also known as uh, Ascepra. So the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation Guidelines from this year, um, they recommend that patients with new onset seizures, they have to be evaluated for stroke and a structural uh, brain disease. And when we don't find a specific cause, the um, CNI doses should be reduced and electrolyte abnormalities like hypomagnesemia should be corrected. Um, the occurrence of encephalopathy late after heart transplant can, should uh, prompt a neurology consult to try to identify any um, underlying etiologies. And like we said before, um, the dose reduction yeah. of causal neuron in, uh, inhibitors should be uh, one of our thoughts when we're treating patients with press. This topic uh, about like neurological Complications is also important because a lot of patients that go to renal transplantation um, in studies have shown that the time and the consequences, including cognitive behavior problems like uh, depression, anxiety, um, is really common. So a lot of patients have fear of death, fear of uh, having rejection or complications. Now we're going to talk about one of the uh, most common complications with this cardiac allograft vasculopathy, which is highly prevalent and is one of the leading cause of death after transplant. Um, in 2010, at the um, Congress of um, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, uh, the coronary angiogram was proposed as a gold standard for allograft uh, vasculopathy evaluation. And many studies have shown that patients that have this uh, issue will have uh, worse clinical outcomes than patients without it. In this uh, illustration, we can see the difference between our typical atherosclerosis when you have uh, the atheroma plaque, basically bone cells and, and Microphages compare when you have allograft vasculopathy that is usually is is intimal, hy intimal hyperplasia and intimal thickening. 
you can see that is diffusely narrowing of the structure, but it's also a difficult disease to diagnose because there's also um, changes in the microvasculature right. that can that cannot be easily picked up on the angiograms. So the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation recommended uh, this nomenclature that has been standardized and have been shown to be associated with a long-term survival. So we have uh, grade zero, one, two, and three. And basically it, it depends on the severity of the luminal narrowing. If you do the angiogram, it shows less than 50% stenosis. Basically it's going to be mild. And then it's important to know what is a primary vessel. When we talk about primary vessel, it denotes that it's the proximal and middle 33% of the LAD, left side complex, RCA, or, or the ramus. And when we talk about secondary vessels, it's the distal 33% or branches like the septals, diagonals, or marginals. When we talk also about severe, we can have a grade one or two, but if there's evidence of allograft dysfunction, we can be seen with usually with decreased uh, EF, or if there's evidence of restricted physiology that can put you in a severe mm -hmm. category that has shown that has uh, poor outcomes. So this was a patient that we took care uh, in the heart failure service uh, last month. Um, he's a 59 year old uh, with history of um, ESRD, home peritoneal dialysis, sleep apnea. And he came for his um, annual evaluation and he has his coronary angiogram. And you can see here on this area of view, you can see the circumflex, you can see the LED. He had a prior stent that can show around like 40% instant yeah. stenosis. And in this other view, you can see that there's not that much significant disease. There's no severe stenosis or any focal lesions that we can describe in this angiogram. Here we can see uh, on an LAO view, we can see the RCA and we can see there's no significant disease. So going back to our classification, we can say that this patient might have mild disease on the branches because if they have uh, some disease around like 20 to 40% stenosis in, in, in some branches. But actually this uh, patient has severe uh, CAV. The main reason is because he had evidence of restrictive physiology. How do we know that uh, he has evidence of restrictive physiology? This can be evaluated through echocardiogram and also can be evaluated with hemodynamics. If the patient has a uh, right atrial pressure more than 12 and um, a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure more than 25, that can be suggestive of restrictive physiology. In echocardiogram, we can use the EA ratio to see if there's restriction. So in the case of uh, imaging evaluation, that like we said before, the whole standard is coronary angiogram, basically because it's widely available, it's prognostic, has low cost, and, but it has its limitations. Usually low sensitivity for early detection, detection because you cannot see the intimal that well. Um, it can change depending on the observer regarding the grading. And in the guidelines, it's class one indication. Therefore, um, it's usually performed, can be performed every one to two years, uh, especially two years if there's presence of renal disease. Other methods that are used are the intravascular ultrasound that have increased sensitivity compared to angiography and can be used during the angiogram. Uh, the advantage is that it has more tissue penetration and it's going to allow to measure the the plague and the bowling of the vessel. Um, the disadvantage is that it has decreased spatial resolution and the cost. This one is in the guidelines and it's 2A recommendation. And then we have uh, optimal, optimal coherence tomography, which has more sensitivity than any of the prior one, uh, 10 times greater spatial resolution than IVUS, 
can change between that server is, is, is less, there's less change between inter server, but it has a limitation, which is we require additional contrast, increased cost, there's no pronostic data, and there's not studies that have shown or, or that have been endorsed in the guidelines. So here we can see a combination of IVOS into one catheter. Uh, this is another method that he, he study in the past uh, patients with transplant to try to figure out if there's another way to, to see if there's uh, allograft vasculopathy. So okay. this one include uh, echocardiogram, W yeah. in a stress echo. They have report low sensitivity in large contemporary analysis. There was a large retrospective cohort study that included almost 500 patients uh, with around 1,200 dobutamine stress echocardiogram um, that was done during eight years. And it showed a low prevalence of a normal result around like 1.8% and a sensitivity of 7%. So, so not that useful the dobutamine stress echo to, to detect this allograft vasculopathy. Regarding exercise, a stress echo, the data that I found was in pediatric population, and it was a single center study done uh, that showed that I, they had high sensitivity and specificity. But like I said, it was a small study, it was a single center, and most center studies have not been done yet. So nuclear image, myocardial perfusion imaging is also used for non-invasive uh, CAV. In this case, a spec shows can show pronostic wow. utility, but it has low to moderate diagnostic accuracy. Uh, in this imaging, there was a patient that you can see the inferolateral reduction in the myocardial blood flow, suggesting of significant um, CAV in the left circumflex coronary artery territory. Therefore, in patients with um, the guidelines yeah. recommend that primary prevention of um, allograft vasculopathy in heart transplant recipient should be include the strict control of risk factors like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. As well, it should be recommended to do physical activity and diet and strategies for prevention for EMB uh, infection. Also, in our population, we use um, statins that have been shown to reduce the the vasculopathy and improve the long-term outcomes regardless of lipid levels. Um, therefore, uh, my experience that I had last month at the uh, Emory University Hospital, we, we, we can use like pravastatin in, in most of the post-transplant patient. Annual or biannual or angiography evaluation should be considered. It should be individualized depending on other factors like if the patient has underlying chronic kidney disease and follow up coronary angiogram is recommended in patient after six months if they had a, um, a PCI, if they had an intervention. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can have a focal lesion and there have been uh, studies that have shown that if, in patient that had um, uh, a stents, they, they, they tend to do better compared if you, if you do it alone. Usually these studies are just a small observational data. And other thing that is important is that substitution of um, mycophenolate, mofetil, or tacrolimus or cyclosporine with a PSI should be considered to prevent and del delay the progression of uh, coronary artery vasculopathy, especially within the two years of heart transplant. In the case of the prior patient that we saw that had um, 3T vasculopathy, he was already on tacrolimus, a low dose, 0.5 and he was on serolimus one milligram daily. Other issue that patients deal after transplant can be malignancy. And the data demonstrate the presence of all types of malignancy in post-heart transplantation. In adults, it's around 60% in five years survivals and 20% in 10 years survival. So it's really common. Um, in adults, skin cancer remains the most common um, malignancy, followed by prostate and lung cancer, with lymphoma being uncommon in adults. But in pediatric yeah. population, lymphoma is the most common malignancy that can present after transplant. The risk factors um, 
in adults include all the recipient age, male sex, sex and Y race. Also, oh. if you have, if the um, donor has prior history of malignancy, that increases the risk of having a uh, malignancy uh, on the recipient. You, um, one of the problems that they can face is uh, PTOD, also known as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, and it usually is driven by Epstein Barr virus infection and E cell in origin. Chronic wow. immunosuppression has been implied as a risk factor for malignancy. And you can see here that um, for early detention and primary detention, we use a uh, viral load. And if it's elevated, the thing that you have to consider is to reduce immunosuppressive therapy. If you're suspicious, the patient should get a endomyocardial cardiac biopsy or, or biopsy. Also, and it's going to, and if it shows, the treatment is to try to reduce immunosuppression therapy and involve other teams to start PTLD treatment. And at the end, this can lead to end stage graft failure. And we should think in patients of in re transplantation if possible. Due to this complication, it's important to know that we need to screen patients. Uh, usually, serology with uh, bio antiviral capsule IgG is recommended, or we can use also um, anti Epstein Barr nuclear antigen, and this should be done before transplant. Here are some recommendations. Uh, General screening for patients after transplant should be according to general population. Uh, initial yeah. evaluation and therapeutic plan for PTLD. Mm. Talk before is patients can develop chronic kidney disease, especially due to calcium neuroinhibitors. Um, um, as we explained before, increase of extracellular matrix in, uh, can lead to glomerulosclerosis. Also, the calcium neuroinhibitors increase the RAS system, leading to um, renal ischemia. Uh, inflammation and decreased post prostaglandins, decreasing renal flow, so it ended up decreasing the GFR. They should have at least a um, renal function test twice a year, according to the guidelines, and the cancer neuron exposure should be lower to the minimum level required for effective immunosuppression in patients that have CKD. If the patient have advanced kidney disease, kidney transplantation should be considered. Uh, regarding the management of cardiovascular risk after heart transplantation, in this illustration, we can see how the immunosuppression therapy can induce increased glucose production, increased appetite, decreasing insulin secretion, um, beta cell ap apoptosis, increasing the alpha deposites, insulin resistance, and leading to a metabolic thing. On top of that, we have to take into account that patients can have um, pre-existing diabetes before transplant. And you can see patients coming to the emergency apartment with hyperglycemic crisis mm -hmm. through a steroid use, or if they were having rejection, mm -hmm. you receive um, high dose pulse steroids, they can become mm -hmm. easily hyperglycemic. Regarding the management of diabetes on transplant patients, metformin remains an excellent agent in patients without advanced renal failure, especially a light recent evidence that there's a lower rate of vasculopathy and post malignancy have been shown with metformin. Also, there is increasing evidence uh, that the use of LDAT2 inhibitors and LP1 receptor agonists uh, reduce major cardiac events and progression of renal disease. As we know, uh, the studies have not taken into account uh, sp the special population, but this is an illustration how they do it. The SGLT2 inhibitors can do it due to hemodynamic uh, effect, decreasing the preload, decreasing the afterload, and the epicardiophage, also leading to weight loss. And the GLP-1 receptors can, include, can increase the um, um, side uh, society um, filling also can lead to increased insulin, glucagon, and decreasing the postprandial glucose, therefore can also lead to weight loss. 
Regarding the aspirin use, there, there are no randomized study analyzing the effect of antiplatelet therapy with aspirin in heart transplant recipients uh, as primary prevention for cardiovascular events. However, there were two recent observational studies that suggest that the use of early aspirin within a year is associated with lower allograft vasculopathy and lower um, allograft vasculopathy related event. So this was um, a trial that evaluated 206 patients between 1991 and 2016. And we can see the difference uh, of survival free of allograft, cardio, coronary allograft vasculopathy in patients that take, took aspirin versus patients that did not take aspirin. Also the, the survival free of, of the disease and death. So these are observational studies, but um, currently there's an ongoing trial called the AREL trial that is done in Canada by the Ottawa wow. Research Institute that is comparing uh, placebo against, against aspirin or clopidogrel. So this will be a prospective randomized trial currently is on phase three. So the recommendation on uh, cardiovascular risk factors um, it shows the guidelines that patients should have good blood pressure control, ideally less than 130 and, uh, millimeters of mercury. And the main medications that they can use can include um, ACE inhibitors uh, and also can include calcium channel blockers. In patients with calcium neuron induced hypertension, the use of HTC has shown um, that it can control the, the, the high blood pressure. Also, modification of risk factor like diabetes and prevention of uh, early detention and therapy of the diabetes is really important for the, for the patient care. So one of the topics within the complications that was more interesting to me was regarding the arrhythmias of heart transplant patients. When I uh, was going to start my rotation in the heart failure service, um, I was thinking when I'm on call, I'm going to receive a post transplant patient and he's going to be in any type of arrhythmia and what do I know about it? I realized that I didn't know about that much. So this was really, really encouraging me to me to review this special topic. So regarding the mechanism of arrhythmogenesis in transplant patient, it varies depending on different factors. So one could be the surgical technique, which can be by cable or by atrial. Um, also could be prolonged graft time ischemia. And this is important because uh, it's important to limit the time from esplantation to reperfusion, since multiple studies have shown that ischemic time more than 240 minutes is associated with uh, rates of atrial fibrillation and increased mortality. Like we discussed before, cardiac allograft vasculopathy can lead to ventricular arrhythmias. When, when we do the surgery, the surgical innervation with the consequence that this implies, chronic reget rejection also can lead to arrhythmias and then graft failure. In this slide, we can see uh, the illustration of the atrial technique. And this technique was one of the initial methods of um, our transplantation, but it was noted to cause significant disruption, as you can see, of the atrial anatomy and subsequent post-operative arrhythmias. The reason uh, of this was because the technique required a long anastomosis to connect the donor to the recipient heart which often lead to uh, severe regurgitation and also require long suture lines that can lead to scar tissue and be the substrate of re tachycardias. Also this technique, because of your cutting the atrium was associated with a more sinus node damage and permanent pacemaker implantation. Um, in the early days when they were doing this technique, they were also doing um, one procedure that is called the De Vega procedure by, uh, that it was developed by a Spanish surgeon that they used to attach the anterior septal leaflet and, uh, and the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve because when they did this technique, they noticed that the patient started to have um, tricuspid regurgitation. In the last decade, this is uh, the method that has been more 
that has been used more is the by cable technique. Um, is is it has less damage to the atrium because the right heart is structured using cable and astomosis. Therefore, we try to leave the right atrium intact. You can see here an illustration of how it looks after the complete transplantation. So, so physiology changes on patients post transplant are due to the autonomic denervation of the heart and lead to several changes. Um, in, in this case, the patient will have a rapid pressing heart rate because they're not going to have the pressing pathetic inhibition um, due to the uh, innervation. Also, they can have silent ischemia. So if a patient post-transplant presents to the emergency apartment, the point can be elevated. There might be some EKG changes, but they, they won't feel it because there's no sensory in their fiber, um, at least early after transplant. And then uh, the other issue is that they can have delayed chronotropic response because they're going to respond basically to the um, catecholamines that are produced, um, not in the postganglionic nerves, those are, they are produced in the adrenal medulla because you won't have those sympathetic nerves. A phenomenon that is really interesting to me when I was reviewing this talk was the patient can have what we call re -inner, uh, re -inner so subsequent re of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system has been observed, but it occurs in a heterogeneous way. So this can, uh, and the other issue is that the, this can prolong the repolarization time, potentially leading to ventricular tachyarrhythmias and one fear complication on post transplantation that is a sudden cardiac death. In this illustration, we can see this is a study that was done showing the myocardial sympathetic re assessed by uh, hydroxyephrine retention of the of the myocardium. On the left, we can see um, myocardium is completely denervated. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, retaining any hydroxyephedrine. And on the right side, you can see that there's some uptake. Therefore, there's some re on the LAD. Usually, uh, the literature says that the, this can happen um, on the following years. Usually what I, what I was able to find is usually after two years. The most common arrhythmia in patients post-transplant is atrial flutter. Why? Because um, they can have re-enter like a circuit due to the suture line. And for typical flutter, catheter ablation can target the CTI and, and it's highly effective associated with low incidence of recurrence. Um, like I say, micro-oriented uh, flutters can also be treated with catheter ablation. And usually they, they involve the donor atrium in a region with low voltage immediately adjacent to the atrial atrial anastomosis. So in this case, we can see the 12 lead EKG when uh, there's some evidence of atypical atrial flutter. When, uh, when we see the intracardiac electro electrograms of a dual decapolar catheter in the right atrium, it shows sinus rhythm on the upper on the on the on the upper side. And then we can see that the patient on the on the um, recipient there's atrial flutter. And here this is the voltage map that shows that the blue and purple areas show low voltage. Um, that means areas of a scar that can be uh, part of the anastomosis of the right atrium, especially along the suture line. On the description of this illustration, this was the suture line run, run, right around here. And the, right, the, the, the red and white dots, they can show the ablation in this case was successful. So patients with uh, flutter post-transplant, they can go for uh, catheter ablation therapy. Atrial fibrillation can be seen um, post-operatively, usually because of the effects of final throats. Uh, prior to transplant, cardiac manipulation. Yeah. We talked before about um, time, um, type for allograft implantation, for graft implantation. During the surgery, there's pericardial inflammation. It could be a sign of rejection, and it could be a sign of heart failure. Most of the patients that have arrhythmias after transplant should be evaluated for rejection and should be evaluated for coronary allograft vasculopathy. So 
The three main strategy of Ray versus Redox control is largely determined by the presence of symptoms on the patient, like in general population, and Ray control might be achieved with beta blocker. The Jackson is generally ineffective because we don't have a parasympathetic denervation. There's parasympathetic denervation, and Redox control can include cardioversion, uh, electrical or chemical with the use of um, antiarrhythmics. Uh, there's minimal experience in catheter relation therapy in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation. And the reason why is because when, they, when, when the surgery is done, we can see here there's an anastomosis of the pulmonary veins on the left atrium. Um, when they do the, the sutures, that creates isolation, electrical isolation, which emulates um, the pulmonary vein isolation that gets done on atrial fibrillation. So we can see in this graph um, the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter and the prevalent change um, post-surgery, post atrial fibrillation is more common, but in stable patients, the incidence is really low compared to atrial flutter, which is have more incidence overall. Regarding anticoagulations, patients with AFib or atrial flutter, we use chest valves, score two also. And something that is really important is we can use no accent and warfarin, but when we use no, we have to take into account interactions, especially with uh, calcium neuron inhibitors, uh, especially with um, cyclosporine, which uh, is a, a strong P glycoprotein inhibitors that can lead to increased levels of um, apixaban in the bloodstream leading to, to bleeding. Other tachycardias like SBT, the majority are lay three months after surgery, and, and usually they're focal or reenteral atrial tachycardia. Like we said before, it could be flutter or, or scarring reentry. And then the treatment, usually we do a EP study and can be a catheter ablation needed. Um, calcium channel blockers and like deltasem and baratomy are contrary indicated, basically because of drug to drug interaction with immunosuppression. Here we can, uh, the other question that I had was, can we use adenosine on heart transplant patients during medical school training? That's something that is really remarked to us regarding the, the, the potential um, uh, harm that can be done using adenosine and heart transplantation. And this was a study in 1990 by Dr. Ellen Bogan and Dr. Thames when he was on, on BCU that showed the electrophysiology effects of adenosine and transplant the human heart. So basically they studied 28 heart transplant recipients. Um, and, and the result is that they show it uh, exaggerated response to adenosine. So these were analog recordings for a single transplant patient that received a dose of adenosine um, to this, um, and that was given 15 seconds early. And you can see in the surface uh, echo, uh, electrocardiogram how the PR interval is prolonging and there's this like a pause. And then in the intracardiac electrocardiogram, you can see that the intervals are also prolonging, and this was attributed to a hypersensitivity of the electrical system to, to the adenosine. Uh, later on, another investigator flyer demonstrated that it can be used, it can be safe. Um, therefore, the 2010 um, American Heart Association guidelines, um, they say that it can be used, but it should be used uh, initially lower dose, usually three milligrams instead of six milligrams for management of uh, SVT on heart transplant patient. Other thing that is important on patients post transplant is that you can have dual P wave. In this one, we can see the recipient pre transplant. And this was after the, the transplant, where you can see that there's two wave, two P wave. So only one is conducting, which is the one of the donor's heart, because the, 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 the recipient heart can have a P wave that can go at a different rate. And it's not transmitting through the um, atrium and then to the ventricle because there's a isolation usually due to the suture lines. So usually when we have SVT, early recurrence less than three months, late recurrence more than six months. And the important part is that you have to evaluate for um, rejection. You have to evaluate for um, vasculopathy and can be also 
um, feasible to get an ID evaluation. So you can use AV nodal blockers with the avoidance of calcium channel blockers because of interaction. And if there's recurrence or uh, cardiomyopathy due to tachycardia, we, e, e, uh, EP study and ablation can be considered. So the incidence of synodontal dysfunction on heart transplant has been reported almost like 80%. And usually are more related to by atrial um, procedure. Um, here we can see that the bicapital surgical ternary was a strongly protective against pacemaker requirement. So the most common EKG finder that we're going to see is going to be right on the branch block, but also um, up to 10% can be, can be having AB blocks and chronic rejection, recurring injury, um, and the myocardiopathy can lead to these um, conduction uh, abnormalities. So in patients with sinus, so this is a patient with a first degree AV block. And the question is, is this an indicator of acute rejection? And this has been disputed in large observational study and have not reported correlation. Um, like I said before, if you have uh, some, um, this is a patient with a grade three R um, rejection that you can see diffuse inflammatory infiltrate with lymphocytes. And there, there's some, um, myocyte injury with um, myocardial edema, and you can say interstitial hemorrhage in this slide. So this is a patient with rejection that can, they can uh, have high degree AB blocks. So in the peritransplant period, you can use, you can use uh, temporary pace mm -hmm. wire, or you can use medications. Um, if that doesn't resolve the problem, yeah. the patient might need to have a a permanent pacemaker implantation. When it's less than six months of the patient is the, the pacemaker, 20% are less dependent in the future. But if, they're after, if the issue um, appears after six months, there's more risk of dependent. Atropine is another medication that this one should not be used because likely it's going to be ineffective. And one small uncontrolled study showed a paradoxical slowing of the heart rate. Uh, causing high degree AB block that in a patient that was administered after heart transplantation. And the other thing that is important, a lot of patients are on medications before transplant, like amiodarone, that can lead to episodes of bradycardia due to um, negatropic, not, uh, negative chronotropic effect after the, after the transplant. Something that is also important is to prevent infection in patients post-transplants. Therefore, yeah. um, a screening for toxoplasma, for cytomegalovirus, for uh, herpes simplex virus um, should be done. And this is like a prophylactic regimen. So we should have the information about if the patient is um, seropositive or if the donor is seropositive, because that way it can be treated by oral gansiclovir. So this is a question to everyone that I hope uh, and we'll get it right. What is the most common sustained arrhythmia in, in orthotopic heart transplantation? I discussed previously, it, it will be atrial fibrillation. So the inspiration of this talk was my rotation last month at the heart failure service with, where I took care of multiple patients. And I realized that during um, our medical training, internal medicine, we don't have the opportunity. And these at least are some... Um, Topic and it's a quick review of what the general cardiology should know about um, complications and management of, of heart transplant patients. I want to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Andrew Smith, Dr. Vivia Gupta, Dr. Nila Sutaria, uh, uh, also Dr. Alana Morris, and, and Dr. Annie Van Bulli yeah. because they were my attendants during that rotation and they support me, and, and it was really inspiring to work with them. If you have any questions, thank you so much. Thank you, Eduardo. Very good. Um, questions from the audience for, for Eduardo. Hey, Eduardo. Steve Clements. Robbie. Hi. Yes, sir. Uh, Eduardo, uh, Robbie and I have noticed that uh, on echo, often uh, the atrial contribution to ventricular filling is not very prominent. Uh, that is, uh, the A wave is low or undetectable often. And also we've noticed like from one patient to the next, the uh, the atrium, the left atrium, for example, is longer and then shorter. 
And it seems to me that uh, in the longer left atriums, I'm sure it has to do with the tissues and the surgical technique, that uh, you, uh, you, you lose some of your atrial kick at that point in time when, you, when you're doing that. So uh, does that make any difference? Uh, have you seen anything about that? Do the surgeons pay any attention to that? Do you guys pay any attention to that when you follow them up? Or what's your reaction to that comment? So during the literature review that I that I had, uh, basically that was not as specifically that, but the fact that when you do the bicable technique, you damage a tissue with um, anastomosis, and there's a scar that can um, lead to um, um, increased filling pressures on the on the on the atria. But there's not like any study, and I couldn't find any information on all the. All this, all the literature that I review regarding that, so that will be an interesting topic to 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 investigate in the future. If there's any correlation with um, with with those findings, yeah, can't it can't be doing a lot of good uh, when we don't see an A wave out there and the atrium's not contributing to uh, diastolic filling. Okay, thanks. Good. Pro Thank you. Yeah, Eduardo. Eduardo, Andy Smith here. Um, Hi, Dr. Good, Smith. Great, great talk. First, I, I want to welcome our new fellows um, and uh, give thanks to our existing uh, pre pre fellows who've been here previous years. But um, also uh, to let you know that uh, starting in November, um, we will have a presence with our advanced heart failure attendings. Uh, that is me and Dr. Gupta and an attending who's been hired by Morehouse uh, to be at Grady. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to being down at Grady and and, and assisting um, with with the, the program down there. Um, the uh, just some comments. Uh, the uh, you know, you, your your presentation just shows how complex um, the pharmacologic management of these patients uh, can be, um, and uh, I think that uh, it, as a cardiologist, if you get out into practice um, and you're not at a transplant center, um, the best advice I have for you would be to be humble, uh, and um, and uh, I've I've been in this field for well over. 32 or 33 years. And as far as medication interactions and that sort of thing, as new medicines come out, uh, we very strongly rely on our farm D here. Uh, and um, so if, if some question comes up, I'll tell the coordinators, check with farm D up, about that. Um, it, it's important to know the, the interactions. So, so for instance, uh, Paxlovid, if you give uh, a patient Paxlovid, you can ruin their kidneys because um, if, if we give a patient Paxlovid, we basically have to stop the calcineurin inhibitor while they're on it. Um, so there, there are just a number of things like that that can happen uh, in the community. And sometimes the, um, the computers don't alert people necessarily to some of these uh, interactions. Uh, so that's uh, one comment, be humble. The second is, is that in order to properly manage these patients, you really need to be able to get uh, drug levels uh, for the calcineurin inhibitors. Um, so if you're at a hospital that doesn't do that, that can be difficult. Um, the other thing is that uh, when you see a patient uh, who's having some type of symptom, consider that it might be a medication side effect. So uh, diarrhea is um, very common. Uh, with uh, mycophenolate um, and uh, th 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 those types of things. So um, the other point I would make is that this our field is, is um, not very well organized with large scale randomized clinical trials. Um, different centers have different approaches um, and uh, can get into some level of inertia where you're having favorable outcomes over time and not changing things. And um, as we brought in new faculty from other programs, uh, we've certainly made a number of changes. Um, and uh, uh, so that's just uh, another point. But the current success rates with transplants are about a 90% one-year survival. And then after that, 
patients have about a 4% more mortality per year. Um, so if you survive the first year after a transplant, you've got a 50% chance of living 15 years, um, you know, depending upon the individual circumstances. So, um, uh, so those are just a few, uh, a few comments, but I thought you covered uh, the various issues very, very well. Question uh, from the audience. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Um, Stand Will, from Robbie. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, there was a question from the audience real quick. Uh, okay. do, you, do you know if PCSK9 inhibitors have any effect on cardiac allograft vasculopathy? So it will have the similar effects as uh, uh, patients with prior with with no transplant. There's like uh, recently several small reports that have demonstrated that these can lower the safety, lower the LDL in post transplant patient, and they do not have a strong drug to drug interaction with the immunosuppression. So they're reasonable um, adjunct therapy to statins um, or patients that are intolerant to statins that they can be used. Same as uh, cetimabine, uh, also known as sedia, that they can also be used on the heart transplant uh, population. Just to follow up to that, San Sherman, uh, can you, uh, you mentioned pravastatin. Is, is there a, a, a reason that you mentioned that particular one? Uh, over the others because it's not certainly not the strongest and and is is the point just to have a statin on board yeah so basically it's one of the is there was a major trial on new england journal with the use of pravastatin on patient after heart transplantation and the, the agent that was used was pravastatin and multiple studies ha have shown that it's one of the the one that has less uh, interaction with other medications Therefore, uh, the experience that I have uh, on our system is that we, we usually use pravastatin. Okay. Yes, Stan, the, the, um, so the, the, the data from that trial actually showed um, improved survival related to a decrease in hemodynamically significant rejection. Um, so just a, a comment about the statins is that um, you have to be aware of the of the interactions and the and the safety so that you don't cause rhabdomyolysis um, related to the metabolism. So there, um, you, you have to be very careful going to higher doses of, of statins. Um, the transplant vasculopathy is not strongly uh, tied to LDL. It's actually um, probably more tied to high triglycerides, which may actually just be. Uh, the fact that it may be tied to more of a metabolic uh, syndrome and um, hyperproliferation uh, proliferation and um, sort of, uh, you know, insulin, uh, if, if you will. Um, so the, uh, and we do use the PSK9 inhibitors in the patients with high LDLs, um, but I'm not aware of data related to uh, transplant vasculopathy. The vasculopathy, you can get um, you know, lipid lesions, uh, but uh, the most common thing to see in the early is just smooth muscle cell uh, proliferation. It's it's similar to the injury that occurs after uh, angioplasty, um, where where you get um, uh, macrophage moving in and, and and getting smooth muscle cell proliferation of the entoma. Do you ever have to switch to Coumadin uh, from the uh... Novel or oral anticoagulants, or, or, is, or have they been very effective in preventing stroke in the atrial fibrillation patient? Um, we, we generally use the DOAX. So, mm -hmm. gotcha. All right. Well, for the sake of time, I, Dr. Mato, by the way, if anyone didn't see, chimed in on the um, Chat that she they've used PCSK9 inhibitors uh, in transplant patients safely, you know. But again, in terms of data, in terms of you know vasculopathy, I guess is is still unclear. But I'm sure it lowers their their LDL. So thanks again to Eduardo and everybody for tuning in. I'll I will just end with some quick words from Dr. Smith, who gave me years ago when I did my heart failure rotation. As fellows, when we rotate on the hospital service, we're given a little bit of a of a uh, slanted view of things because obviously we're seeing the, the patients that are having the hardest time with their 
transplant complications because you do the hospital service like golly why in the world would you want to transplant dr smith wants to say you got to come to our transplant clinic and see all the you know the the rest of the patients that are doing so well um you know and just cruising as outpatients so uh, and, and same same goes for the lvad patients the same the LVAD. You said the same yeah you said well there, there weren't a lot of lvads around in my in my day as a as a fellow but but I, I'm sure it's the same with the LVADs. So it's a it's a very gratifying field to practice in. So uh, think about it as a as a career. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Thanks y'all are there. <laughs> <laughs> I will see everybody next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.